Hello there. Thank you for joining me on this second part of our lecture videos on this chapter on metabolism. So this is a slide just to summarize what we have covered so far. So far, we have learned that energy was often defined as an ability to do work. I did propose, however, that there was a problem with this definition. And this was because this definition fails to acknowledge the fact that energy still exists, even when it may not be currently available to be used. So there are many different types of energy that we can list, and it depends a little on what source you use, of how many of these they will say that there are. But these are some of the ones that I could think of. However, it is these two that I am mostly interested to discuss with you. Let's have a look at these two in more detail. So, let's start with kinetic energy. You can think of kinetic energy as the energy in motion. Let's think of that using an example. Here we can see how this player has thrown the baseball. And as this ball is now flying through the air, it is in motion. And this would be an example, of course, of the kinetic energy. Let's have a look at the other one now. Potential energy instead is the energy that is stored within the object, ready to be released. So it is dependent, for example, on its relative position on something else. I can think of a good example of this. So how many of us have ever helped out a friend with moving into their new home, only to find out that they live multiple floors up and have this heavy washing machine that needs to be carried up there. I don't know about you, but it certainly has happened to me. So anyone who has carried a washer upstairs knows that it is heavy. As you carry it up the steps, you are helping to store more potential energy to it. And if for God forbid, for some reason, you or your helper were to drop that machine, it comes down the stairs fast, thanks to the gravity. So this is it falling down. This would be it releasing its potential energy that was stored in it as you were carrying it upstairs. I think I have another good example of this for you to consider. Let's have a look at it. So, let's consider two particular spots on this figure about the books on a bookshelf. First, see this arrow pointing to the books that are firmly on the shelf. They are sitting there nice and solid. The second arrow points to a book that has fallen off from the shelf and keeps falling down. So it is moving along. So based on all that you have learned just a moment ago, what kind of energy would each of these be an example? I will pause here for a bit so that you have a chance to decide your answer. Okay, let's have a look at the answers now. So, the book that is resting firmly and comfortably on the shelf, that book has stored energy in relation to the floor because of the gravity. So that will be, of course, potential energy that it has. It has potential to fall down from the shelf, but it is not currently doing so but this energy is stored there to do so when the conditions so allow. The second example was this book that was falling. So of course this book is in motion. That is the important thing here. So the book is currently moving along. So that would be an example of the kinetic energy. 
I hope that that helped you to get your head around these two. Now, we get to an interesting question here. How can we measure energy? And as a side note, I should share at this point that I do not want you to worry about the free energy or energonic or exergonic energy. What I want to do is for us to focus on what I will be sharing with you here, okay? So I was going to ask you, how do we measure energy? Well, the answer is that it really depends on what purpose we might be wanting to measure energy for. A lot of these applications that are interested in measuring energy have to do with electricity, heating and cooling, engineering, and of course, all sorts of appliances. But as we are about biology in this class, there are two that we will be paying particular attention to. And you may have heard about both of these earlier on, at least to some level. So, a Joel, which is commonly abbreviated by a letter J, is the measure of the work done by a force of one newt. I think that though we as biologists will be more interested in a unit of calorie. So you may have seen these calories being used in many nutritional labels with food products. What is perfect, probably most worthy here is that the term calorie that you see on these food packages is actually kilocalories. So from our review of the measurement system in a lab earlier on, you might remember that the term kilo tells us that one kilocalorie is actually 1,000 calories. So, okay, we are fine with the idea of calories being listed to these food product labels, right? But what about if I ask, where do we get these values from? So I would assume that if I were in a traditional classroom, some students would suggest that maybe they have a list of how many calories a certain amount of particular ingredient includes, right? So then you could calculate the total calorie content from that, adding all of your ingredients. That's not a bad suggestion, but we can do even better, I think. So let's start solving this mystery by looking at the definition of a calorie. Calorie is measured as the amount of energy needed to raise the temperature of one kilogram of water by one degree of Celsius. So writing the definition is our answer. Let's break it down and have a look of how we can measure the calorie content of any food product or product in general using this principle. And I might say that I often like to ask you as homework to draw this machine. Of course, I would not be looking for your artistic abilities, but you including all of the relevant parts. So let's draw it together. So pump calorie meter is a machine that we use to do just that. See this little metal container here? So that's where we would put the food that we want to measure. And then once the container is embedded in a water bath, we ignite the food and it burns as we measure the amount of heat that it gives out. By, and by doing a little bit of math, as we would know the volumes of the food, water in the bath, and the change in the water bath's temperature, well, then we can calculate the calorie content of that food. But let's look at that by drawing this machine together, as I said. So we're going to start by adding our food sample here. And let's label that as well.
And this food sample could be anything at all, really, and it wouldn't even have to be food. But we're going to assume that just for the sake of making things a little easier for us. The next thing that I want to add to this diagram is going to be the burning chamber. Chamber. Sometimes this also is also known as the steel bomb. So let's label that as well. So the purpose of the burning chamber is that that keeps the food or any material that we're measuring inside in there. And then we look what happens and what we get out of burning it. So to do this burning, we might need also ignition wires. Let's add them here. And I'm going to draw them connected to a power source to drive the ignition. So that's just going to be, for me, a simple battery that I'm drawing here. And I'm going to label those just for the sake of completedness as well. So there we have our ignition wires and the power source. And these will cause, of course, the uh, food sample in this chamber to be ignited when they, they are triggered. So the other thing that I guess that we could add to our diagram here, we're going to add some sort of an oxygen supply to the chamber. So there needs to be oxygen so that the material in this chamber can burn. So I'm going to label that as well. So it can be just a tube. We can be able to control that tube as well if we want to make it a little fancier. So now the next step that's going to be important for us is to figure out a way how we can capture all the heat that's released from burning that food sample within the burning chamber. And how we're going to do that is by putting that chamber into a water bath. So this is basically just a water bucket. And I'm going to do a little waves there just to show that it's water here. Of course, it wouldn't be wavy if it's inside the machine. But that gives us an idea. And for the sake of completedness, I'm going to color it in as well. So I'm going to label it. This was our water bath. So it's full of water there. Uh, what else do we need? We want to make sure that we are capturing the uh, amount of temperature change. So we want to put also a thermometer into this water bucket, right? So as you see, my drawing is not the prettiest by any distance, but it's showing all the parts. And that's what I'm asking you to do as well. So this is our thermometer. So there we go. 
And what else could we need? Well, we want to make sure that the water within this bath is very well mixed. So we want to be making sure that there's some sort of propelling action happening there. So I'm going to add this stirrer into there. So it makes sure that this water within the water bath is moving along. And by doing so, the temperature is getting distributed evenly throughout this water bath, uh, the temperature that's released by this burning chamber. So that's going to be our stirrer. And the only thing that I can think of to add here anymore, really, is going to be our insulation jacket, which is basically the machine and insulated walls of the machine, where all of these parts that we have just reviewed are going to be housed inside. So that's what this final box that surrounds all of this is going to be. And of course, we often find that a lot of these are automated. So we have digital displays and so on. But the very basic concept of the bomb calorie meter, regardless of whether it's more manual or more automated, it's the same concept. So I'm just going to add where could I fit it in here. So that's our insulation jacket there. So I think that this diagram really includes all that I can think of that we should cover in this discussion of the different parts of the uh, bomb calorie meter. You'll see that it's not about having perfect drawing abilities. It's all about naming the correct part. And on that note, I think that we're good to continue our discussion. So the next thing that I want us to discuss is the concept of energy that is needed to activate a particular reaction. And to look at this, I have drawn this little graph here. You can see the time on the horizontal x-axis and the amount of free energy on the vertical y-axis. Now, for the reaction to take place, the activation threshold must be met. So in other words, there must be enough energy to meet this threshold. And only once it has been met, the reaction will move forward. Let's have a look of this with two examples. So in this first example, we have a reaction that will not be able to meet the activation threshold required for the reaction to proceed. So I've drawn it here. And since we are not meeting this threshold, there is not going to be the reaction taking place. So it just goes back. Nothing happens. Now, how about if we meet the threshold? Let's look at that kind of scenario. Well, here we have the amount of energy that actually meets this threshold. And as a result, the reaction will then take place and continue further from this. So it will proceed. So we have sufficient energy for the reaction to be triggered. Pretty clear stuff so far, right? Well, now let's bring in the concept of an enzyme. And we saw this earlier in one of our labs. So let's discuss that. So what happens if an enzyme is present in this reaction? Well, in this case, the activation threshold is brought down. So it is easier for the reaction to reach the required activation energy here. 
And let's have a look at that. So now, in our previous example, this would not have been enough to meet the activation threshold. Uh, but now, with the lower activation threshold, thanks to the enzyme, we will easily meet it. And the reaction now proceeds. So you might remember that in general, enzymes were something that assist with the reaction. How they assist could vary, whether it was making the reaction faster, lowering activation threshold, as in this case, or making the reaction more efficient or complete, and so on. Now, we are ready to talk about thermodynamics. So we will look at the laws of thermodynamics as the next thing. And while there are actually more laws from law zero, the first, second, and third law, I want us to focus only on two of these. Although these may sound really fancy, they are actually quite logical and quite straightforward. So, okay, we're going to start with the first law of thermodynamics. The first law of thermodynamics states that energy is conserved. But this I mean that energy cannot be created out of nothing, nor does energy just disappear. So what I mean by this is that the total amount of energy in the universe is constant. Those of you who are visual learners might find this little sketch that I have added here useful. What we see here is that the energy in all these forms that I have drawn here as fire, as a dog, and as boiled water, the total amount of energy is maintained constant. So that is our first law. Not too bad, right? Now, let's look at the second law of thermodynamics. The second law of thermodynamics states that when energy is transferred, we lose some amount of it in the process. And the same goes also for the energy from being transformed from one form to another. So when energy is changed, we lose some amount of it in the process. So to put it in other words, there is always so-called cost for every transfer or change of the form of energy. And this cost is that some of it is lost in the process. What I do want to add to this is that how we usually lose it is as heat. Again, those of you who are visual learners, well, I have this little picture showing here that first we transfer energy along the electric wire. And there would be a cost as a loss of some energy in this process. The other scenario that I have illustrated here is that when we change energy, and in this case it is from food to physical movement, this loss of energy happens also here. So that's it. There, that is all of these two laws of thermodynamics that I wanted you to get familiar with. And I guess that a good question to ask here would be that how do these relate to what we have been just discussing? Well, the answer is, of course, the fact that we are going to be interested in the two next chapters about photosynthesis and cellular respiration. So let me expand on this a little more. So we remember that in the process of photosynthesis, energy, which is going to be the sugar, cannot just appear it must be made of something, and in this case, it's going to be the solar energy that it comes from. And then for the second one, remember that when we are converting chemical energy into physical movement, so muscle activity, as a loss of some of it, some heat is generated. I hope that we feel good about these two. Now, let's look at the concept called entropy. So the term entropy refers to the amount of relative disorganization. 
And you might ask that, what do I mean by this? Well, one way to think about this is to think about what happens to an old castle over time. It falls apart into smaller and smaller and smaller pieces over time. And all this happens spontaneously. So when you think about what happens everywhere over time, well, everything falls apart over time. Another great way of looking at this is by comparing these two pictures of the very same room. So this nice and neat, tidy room here, it has very little entropy. So think about it as things being on their places, neat and organized and all stuck together. That equals very little entropy. And then conversely, this very messy room where everything is spread apart in smaller pieces and all over the place. Well, this equals to high entropy. If you have kids, you know that they will tell you that the mess, so disorder, happens spontaneously. And having tried to convince a kid to clean up a room, you would also know that generating organization, so cleaning the room, requires energy. And this is the very reason why we do not teach our children about entropy until much, much, much later. Okay, two more concepts that I still want to talk about. ATP is something that we have already earlier on referred to when we talked about the cellular respiration where sugar was converted into this ATP. And at that time, I mentioned that ATP can be considered as the energy currency of a cell. And what I meant by that is that cells use this ATP to drive nearly all of their activities where energy is needed. So re it really is just energy in a form that cells can use it. With all that in mind, let's look at what the ATP stands for. So ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. And as common in biology, the name is the key for us to understand its structure. Let's have a look at that. So, a single ATP molecule is made of adenine and ribose. So, these two make up our nucleotide. And in addition, very importantly, we have three phosphate groups in it. So, really, the description of what it is is well in its name. And interestingly, it is this structure that makes ATP very unstable. So what I mean by this is that this group of three phosphate groups is not likely to remain as they are. So let's look at that a little bit more. So what I have here is the single ATP molecule. And what we are going to focus here especially is the number of phosphate groups. So with the ATP, it is going to be, of course, three of these. But sometimes we give away one of these phosphate groups, which gives up energy, which the cell can then use, and also changes the molecule into adeno sign diphosphate. So it has only two phosphate groups left now. But importantly, by doing so, we were able to release energy for the cell to do its job. And the reverse can also be true. We can 
store energy within the cell for later use by binding it into a phosphate group, which would now make a DP into a TP. So from two to three phosphate groups. So what happens a lot of the time is that we keep going between these two forms, ATP and ADP, releasing and binding energy as it is needed in the cell. I hope that that makes sense. And there is only one more concept that I want to talk with you in before we can wrap up this video and this chapter. So let's tackle that too. So we are going to talk a little bit about enzymes. And I think that we have already covered this concept in our previous lecture videos, but I do want to revisit it as a reminder. So let's talk a little bit about enzymes. And we will look at this full discussion by using a visual example too. On the right hand side of this diagram or this slide. So let's use that too. You might remember that enzyme was something that assists in chemical reactions. So the thing to keep in mind is that this chemical reaction would happen anyway, but by adding an enzyme, we were able to help with this reaction to happen. What that help is, that can vary a lot. It can be speeding up the reaction, lowering the activation energy needed, making the reaction more efficient, and so on and so on. So in this example that I have given visually on this right hand side of the screen, you can see the enzyme as this blue blob and the reactant is going to be this purple blob. So in this reaction, the enzyme will help with splitting this reactant into two. And this will happen as follows. If you look closely, you can see this arrow showing that this reactant, which was our purple blob, is going to bind into the enzyme, which was this blue blob. So an enzyme has an active site where the reactant binds to. And we see just that in this figure. See how the reactant has bound into the active site where the reactant binds to. So there is physical change in the enzyme's shape when this happens. It no longer looks like it looked at the very beginning. Okay, what will happen next? Well, now the enzyme is doing its job, right? And in the next step, we will see that it has completed the tasks. So you can see that the enzyme helped to break the reactant into two products. And these products are now leaving the enzyme's active site and going to do whatever they go to do next. Another thing that I want to point out here is now that the enzyme has completed its job and the reactants left its site, now the enzyme returns back to its original shape. So one of the big things to take away from this process is that enzyme does not get used down in quantity as it does its job. It can be reused time and time again. There is always the same amount of enzyme to be utilized when the reaction has been completed. So that's pretty cool about enzyme. We can reuse them time and time again. Now I want to highlight one more point and then we are done, okay? So your textbook does a little bit of a mistake here. It claims that all enzymes speed up the reactions, but that is not the case. As you might remember from what I said at the beginning, the enzyme is responsible for assisting in chemical reactions, but it can be many different types of assisting that they do. Remember lowering the activation energy, which we looked at earlier in this chapter, or it may be making the reaction more efficient or more complete or whatever else we might think. 
One way how an enzyme may assist the reaction is by speeding it up. This type of an enzyme is known as catalyst. So catalyst speeds up reactions. But note that not all enzymes are catalysts. And that really concludes everything that I was wanting to share with you on this chapter. I know that it may have seemed like a lot of material, but it is important for me to note these points as we tackle the two of the following chapters, photosynthesis and cellular respiration. And in a way, you have already done a huge amount of work to cover the content for these chapters in this chapter. So, those two will be much smoother and faster to go through, I would say. So, all that is left for me to do in this video is to thank you for having joined me in it, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Bye for now!